Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the All Saints podcast. I've just finished a fascinating conversation with Tyler Turner, one of the members here at All Saints Presbyterian Church, and I want to give you guys a chance to listen to what we talked about. It was actually prompted by a conversation we had a number of weeks ago when we were just meeting to talk about various other things on the subject of technology, and at one point um, I noticed his phone, which looked to me extremely strange, and on further investigation it proved to be highly primitive, and deliberately so. And so that spun off into a conversation we had then, and many aspects of that we revisited today, along with a bunch of other things. There were some psychological things about the effect of technology upon us. There were some theological issues about the relationship between our uh, vocation as people created in the image of God, the creation mandate, the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of temptation, our embodiment as physical creatures, a whole bunch of other practical things uh, from procrastination to distraction to productivity to family life and everything else. I'll let you just jump in and listen to the rest of that conversation. Uh, A couple of quick notes. I made reference to a book by Neil Postman called Amusing Ourselves to Death and also another book by him called Technopoly. Those are two books I recommend and I'll include references to them in the show notes which you'll be able to uh, look at on the podcast or on the video version of this podcast. Uh, Also, I gave a talk in which I made further reference to the beginning of Amusing Ourselves to Death, and I'll find that talk for you and also link to that so you'll be able to take a a look at that, Lord willing. So uh, hopefully those resources will be helpful to you. Um, And without further ado, then I give you my conversation with Tyler Turner on the subject of technology and its perils and pitfalls. God bless and bye for now. So I'm here with... Mr. Tyler Turner, member of the congregation here at All Saints in Fort Worth. And we were talking, well, this conversation arose a few months ago because we met up, we had lunch, we were talking about um, usual pastoral things, just catching up, uh, talking about our families and talking about um, uh, things that have been happening in our lives. And uh, at one point, Tyler, you took out your mobile phone and <laughs> I, I, I wonder if you could just describe your mobile phone for the benefit of people listening to this. Would you just give us a quick description? Sure, yeah. My students have described it as the cassette tape, um, so it gives you an idea of the general uh, appearance. Uh, basic, it's, it's called a light phone, L-I-G-H-T. Um, this is the second iteration of this phone, and basically it's meant to be kind of a bare-bones Still has 4G access, but mostly um, phone calls, text messages, um, 4G Wi-Fi hotspot availability. Also, um, with progressive operating system updates, uh, podcast streaming, um, even even a limited GPS functionality. Though it's the e-ink screen, so imagine a Kindle operating a GPS (laughs) map, and it's clunky, and it's a pain in the rear, but in all of the proper ways that it needs to be um, right. for a person that's trying to seek out a phone like this. So, And, and it's not like it's a $5 phone, right? It, it, it wasn't super expensive, Correct. but it's not super cheap either. Correct. Yeah. I paid 300 I think it may be running 350 now. It's running right. a, an open source uh, version of Android. Right. Um, so so it's, a, it's a phone that mm-hmm. is deliberately designed to do less even though it costs more mm-hmm. than, let's say, a, a three-year-old middle-of-the-range smartphone that you could probably pick up for a hundred and something dollars. Correct. Right. Yeah, and I, the problem I ran into when I was trying to go for a, a stripped-down, limited-access version of a phone is that you, even the twenty-five-dollar flip phones that you'll find a, find in a convenience store still have all of the email access, all of the Twitter and Facebook and any social media you want. So they still run an Android operating system that mm-hmm. still has access to all of right, those right, things, right, right, which right. is the exact same exact thing that I was trying to avoid. Okay, so so let's just get this straight. You are a um, an intelligent, <laughs> theologically educated, busy uh, father of four, mm-hmm. uh, married uh, to Bethany with four delightful young children. Uh, you're a teacher. You uh, you have a lot to do mm-hmm. um, uh, in your days professionally. Then you've got a bunch of stuff you're doing in the evening. You're doing some theological training and education in the evening. You're studying. Mm-hmm. You, you're exactly the sort of person who would normally make the default decision that, well, I, for example, have made. Like, I'm busy. 
it's therefore really helpful for me to have access to all of the uh, information, communication, internet, video, email, every other kind of app that I can get on my phone that cost me $200. This phone cost me about $220. So oh. it's, it's like two-thirds the price of yours, and it can do 10 times as much. So, <laughs> so you're, you are deliberately choosing to make it impossible for yourself to access certain functions, which yes. everybody else mm-hmm. that I know, almost everybody else I know, mm-hmm. regards as almost essential. So why? <laughs> um to attempt to retrain my brain to not crave that um, the incessant always needing to be plugged in, always connected, always seeking something to do um, in the what uh, George Grant called um, solitude seclusion um, or the um, deprivation, sorry, the solitude deprivation um, to avoid that. See, I found myself always, you know, like, like many people always busy, but never quite being as productive as I wanted to be. And so, um, knowing it's, there's the surface level. Okay. I'm spending time on these, these, um, applications, but then there's also, there's also a lot of the opportunity cost, um, of even when I'm doing something that I might consider productive, my mind being constantly drawn to what kind of notifications am I missing? What kind of conversations am I missing? What, mm-hmm. what are the things that I could be doing that feel good to me, but right, aren't right, necessarily right. accomplishing anything? Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I want to come clean both for the sake of our conversation for our mm-hmm. listeners and, and just so for transparency, where I'm coming from in this um, uh, discussion about technology <laughs> and about smartphones in particular. Yeah. Um, I have um, a, uh, three years ago, it would have been middle of the range. I tend to buy slightly older, middle of the range things because basically then they've they've dropped in price, but they're not going to drop much lower before yeah, they sure. drop out of existence. So, mm-hmm. so it's a good way of getting the stuff that you can get. Um, but I've removed or made difficult to access some of the functions in the sense that I've I've not got most of the kind of social media, in fact, any of the social media apps apart from YouTube. But even that, I've I've removed YouTube from the front page. Yeah. The first thing I do when I get a phone is to go through all the list of apps and uninstall all the ones I've never heard of and quite a lot of the ones I have. <laughs> sure. Um, so there's no Facebook on there and so on and so right. forth. That's been a bunch of conscious decisions. It, it feels like, yes. and, and they've flown, flowed from some of the same convictions that you and I talked about before that I want to just explore yeah. today. Um, but I do, um, I use my phone for email. I, I have a... Uh, uh, a habit tracker app which restricts me to three email checks a day mm. if I'm to fulfill the habit, yeah. plus up to three more what I call um, uh, being responsible checks. So if it gets to the middle of the afternoon and I think I have good reason to um, anticipate receiving another email before mm-hmm. um, the last hour of work when if I'm supposed to check it again, or if it's in the evening and I think there's a chance I might get something from the session before tomorrow morning that I need to know about or something like that, then I'll check again. Sure. But I, I turn off all the notifications. Um, <clears throat> I use it for texting. I use my phone quite a lot for listening to podcasts and so on. Mm-hmm. But um, I stopped using Facebook um, a number of years ago for anything political, religious, or ideological. Mm-hmm. And that... That meant, in, in effect, I stopped using it for almost everything. Sure. So I think I think the last thing I posted. <laughs> What's was the use then? <laughs> like, yeah. the... Um, so so um, that gives you a picture of 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 me and you. So I'm I, I guess I'm a you are the what we might call let's say a digital minimalist. Uh, you've got the functions which you could. It's hard to avoid seeing a justification for in terms of being contactable professionally and by your wife and. Um, emergency use and some mm-hmm. measure of convenience, but you've been extremely picky and you've paid to be picky to have less than me. <laughs> well, uh, and, and to put it in perspective, I, I still have, you know, I, I've, I've got a MacBook Pro at home. I've got an iPad um, mm-hmm. that I use. I even have my old iPhones um, that, you know, and this, again, this phone has a 4G Wi-Fi hotspot. So if there's right. some kind of functionality, um, you, you know, utilizing uh, listening to audio files from a uh, Google Drive or mm-hmm. um, anything like that, that, Spotify or whatever, I can do that actually in the car still right, right, um, right, right. through this 4G Wi-Fi hotspot. Right. And so 
The main thing to me, again, it's about retraining. And so I'm thinking through the moments um, when you mm-hmm. have a split second in the middle of a day waiting on an order that's coming up, whether you're with your friends or not, or you're by yourself, your immediate response is always hand in pocket, pull check out the phone, phone yeah, check yeah, the yeah. phone. And that's what I'm trying. There's, there was something in my brain that was I, I just knew was craving that, just right, had to right, reach right. out for it. And I tried... I tried removing the apps, um, <laughs> and and what happened was I, there's still browsers, you know, right, and yeah, it's yeah. like, well, I, and the browsers are useful, and so I don't want to get, I don't want to delete those, because so, the browser is the platform for everything, exactly. And so then, well, you know, how hard is it to go to Facebook or Instagram or anything else on those browsers? And so it was only very minor delayed gratification there, and so this is removing all of those things one step. If I want right, to check right. any of those things, I'm able to, but it takes it out of the immediacy right. of needing to do it. So I, I should um, come clean then. You, you, listeners have got a sense, certainly a sense of where you're coming from. Mm-hmm. I guess I'm reasonably normal, um, perhaps a little more restrictive than normal. I've, I've, sure. I've been finding that email in particular um, was drawing my attention at times when I didn't want it. Mm-hmm. Um, but what, well, my aim in having this conversation mm-hmm. is to do a couple of things. First, it's to explore some of the rationale mm-hmm. underlying the kind of uh, decisions that you've made, which are, I think, extreme, not in a negative sense, but sure. on one end of a spectrum sure. of decisions that I think all of us ought to be making on the basis of the same kinds of considerations. Mm-hmm. So there's that, and, and so it's exploring the background, like why, 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 and what's underneath mm-hmm. this? What, what warrants such skepticism about technology in some context? Yeah. And the, the reason for that is, is, secondly, not to try and persuade everybody to buy a light phone. You don't have shares in that company, right? <laughs> um, it, but my aim is not to get people to sure. become like me or to become like you, right. but rather on the basis of having thought through some aspects of the media ecology, to become more self-conscious and deliberate and mm-hmm. disciplined in making decisions about how they use it. Yeah. And my wife, who may be listening to this now, Nicole, will be chuckling at this point. The, the idea of me talking about um, being disciplined in, <laughs> in use of my phone, because there have been times when um, it's been frustrating yeah. for actually for me and also for my family, because mm-hmm. I get a text message or two or three text messages in five minutes and, and, I'm checking and one of them is a significant pastoral concern. And then while I'm there, I check the email and then something else comes up. And yep. so I'm, and the, the balance is to work out, okay, how do you make it possible for yourself to respond to things that you ought to be able to respond to right. and not to be distracted by things you ought not to be right. so that you can fulfill, and this is a key thing, so that you can fulfill <laughs> other obligations, right. relational obligations, right. work obligations mm-hmm. and so on. And I, I, I said to, to Nicole again quite recently, I think it might be the case that this is not something that we get sorted out at a particular point in our lives and then we let it run. Sure. I think this is likely just a battle we're stuck with. Mm-hmm. Just like we all have cars, or most of us have cars, and therefore driving responsibly is something you have to do whenever you get in the car. Mm-hmm. You've got to constantly be watching yourself that you're not getting frustrated, not driving too fast, etc. So also, we've all got technology, and what we constantly need to be doing is looking at ourselves, saying, am I doing this the right way? Mm -hmm. But what goes into that is certain well-thought-through convictions about the wisdom of safe driving or the wisdom of technology use. So can we we jump into some of the um, underlying Mm -hmm. ideological or theological or personal factors that drove this decision you've already hinted at some of them where would you how would you sketch the the why quest the answer to the why question if you had to take it to the next level deeper yeah. um as i you know i'm, I'm like most again m- most people that that make it an issue of willpower mm-hmm. um and so uh, you know be often just very frustrated with um okay i just I need I need to stop wanting that. I need to stop pulling the thing out of my phone. I need to you know yada yada. Um, I, I did 
did some research into the technologies that are going into those applications and the platforms and, um, you know, some documentaries are helpful in this, in this area, whistleblowers in the social media um, arena. And basically just learning about the, the neuroscience tech <laughs> divisions that these guys employ to basically, you know, quote unquote, hack our brains. Yeah. yeah. You know, so that at that point you start to see it's not, it's not a matter of willpower. And as some of them would phrase it, the, the, the cards are stacked, stacked against us. Right. 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 And so they're, they're, tapping into something fundamental and the way in which our brains work that, you know, if you ask anybody, why do they get onto Facebook? It's always going to be something along the same lines of we yeah, want to yeah, keep yeah. up with relationships, you know, yeah. good and right. Like these are great things, yeah. but yeah. that's yeah. not why they stay on there for hours. Right. And it's not the thing that the guys who design those neuro tapping features of the mm -hmm. tech are trading on right so the, the classic example of this i always think is the infinite scrolling feature yes which yep. as a raskin who invented it has apologized <laughs> for inventing right um <laughs> and that is a classic example i don't know if it's classic uh, whether it's old enough to be classic but it's a very very good example of a of how the technology you said hacks our uh, neuro neurological functioning right it it works by the by trading on the, our brain's subconscious desire for future for short term future rewards. Yeah. So if there's an <clears throat> uncertain but likely possibility of a short term positive outcome, oh, we'll pull the handle again. Mm -hmm. If if, it, if you're standing, imagine yourself standing at a slot machine. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And and every time you pull the handle. It costs you nothing, mm -hmm. you think, but there's a small chance of seeing another like right. or of getting 25 cents or $5 out of the machine. Yep. You just stand there all day pulling it right. because, hey, what have you got to lose? Uh, except what you've got to lose is all day <laughs> right? <laughs> and right. all the other stuff you could have done in that time. Yes. So it's the, the, um, the, the features of the technology. Mm-hmm. It's interesting you talk about this. What's the name of the documentary that has become quite popular? It was on Netflix. Social Dilemma. Um, Social Dilemma. Yeah. Is, is, did you watch that? Or yes. Is, yeah, right, okay. Yeah. And, and whether, was that a, a main feature, or was that something you watched later after you made this decision? And how, what other things did you look at? I think I, I... So I got this phone before that time. Mm -hmm. um, it was right after we came back from overseas. We needed to update phones, and that was just something that I wanted to try out. But it wasn't long after that that I watched the documentary and mm -hmm. just was reinvigorated in my in those convictions um but yeah i mean, it saw that as well and i mean i periodically like to get the wall street journal and so articles coming out talking about um the connection between um basically the dopamine that these play that these things are are, are playing on and and depression right. and so it you know ever increasing depression rates and thinking about okay well if it's the slot machine if it's the possibility the dopamine rush of there's something exciting that's coming down the line mm -hmm. um what's what's the depression side of that right. um and it's the lack of reward yes. that comes right yeah. um along with the realization and this is kind of where we get into the theology of things of of what we're actually not accomplishing right. the realization of, <laughs> yeah. of all of the time that was wasted that will never get back again. Yes. 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 Um, that was traded for what? Yeah. And nothing to show for it. Cause this is, this is strikes me as interesting. I've seen some research suggesting that there's a connection between social media use and depression because what's happening is your brain is being trained to need that kind of easy stimulation in order to release the happy hormone, mm. dopamine. Sure. I mean, and dopamine is almost like five years ago, nobody knew what dopamine was. Now everybody knows that dopamine is the hormone your brain releases, mm -hmm. which gives a, a, a short sensation of pleasure. Yeah. It's released when you um, eat uh, sh sugary candy. It's released when you pull the handle on a slot machine. Mm -hmm. It's released when you swipe, swipe, swipe. It's released when you take cocaine or drink alcohol. Mm -hmm. All these things are addictive because they generate a dopamine rush. Um, so there's the neuroscientific explanation, which is that we're just not 
wired to resist that and if it's like giving a, a two-year-old kid loads of candy and mm. then saying right now i've got some wholemeal bread with peanut butter eat this and they're like no i don't want to eat that because this this gives me the the rush so so right. what happens is normal life no longer stimulates us right um and so that's a neuroscience explanation but your <clears> point <throat> i think goes deeper theologically because it mm -hmm. connects to the cultural mandate and it suggests right. What we're built for is meaningful accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And it's not what social media is doing. It's what we're right. not doing right. that's really harming us. Right. So why are people depressed? Well, it's because it's they didn't do anything mm -hmm. yesterday. Right. You get to Monday morning and somebody says, hey, what did you do at the weekend? And they're embarrassed. Or maybe they're just past embarrassed because... Mm -hmm what they did was, well, what they do every weekend, which is like, well, I got up late and just, I didn't get out of bed till three hours later until my battery went flat and I needed to walk across the room to find a charger, you know? Right. So what a depressing kind of existence. Right. right. And they're not getting the return on their investment. Right. Because it actually for. isn't satisfying. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, and it, it also gets into, you know, the, in terms of productivity, like your example, we're always going to choose the easier route. Um, when, when given the option, well, Right. We, um, unless we have sufficient reserves of willpower to resist the easy route. Right, right. So, um, and, and that the reserves of willpower point is um, that's um, Cal Newport, deep work, I think. Okay. Who makes the point that yeah. we, we have a certain, maybe it's another, another book, it might be another one of his books. We have finite reserves mm -hmm. of the cognitive capacity to take the hard path. Yeah. And... You notice it in the gym, actually. If you if you go to the gym mm -hmm. late in the day, when you're a bit tired anyway, mm -hmm. and you get to the fourth set and you think, I said yesterday I was going to do one more. Yeah, no, no. You're like, and, and you just run out of the... Right. To push through the pain barrier. Right. So, yes, right back where you were. So uh -huh. um, we have finite capacity to mm -hmm. resist the temptation to take the easy route. Yes, yeah. And this is the, you know, the procrastination syndrome as well, right? right? right. Is this, this is the, um, when I've got a lot of, a lot of things I want to do, um, procrastination 101 is, is organizing all the things that I need to do yeah. to where I don't yeah. actually accomplish any of those things, but I feel like I'm getting something done right, right. at the same time, which, you know, that's, that's a lot of, when we talk about these technologies as tools, um, they're just incredible tools. So as, right, right. if, as tools, as machines, they are, just incredible in what they can accomplish. Um, however, mm. it's how they're being used. And this is, this is something that, you know, one of the guys on social dilemma says is there's only two industries in the world that refers to their customers as users. Um, <laughs> and it's one is drug users and the other is uh, technology yes. users. Right? Well, I, I want to come back to this point you make about tools yeah. because there's a whole swathe of literature. I, I hear what you're saying. And I, uh -huh. I, I think I'm, I'm not disagreeing with your point as far as you're making it. Sure. But the vocabulary of tools sometimes is misdeployed mm -hmm. to give the impression that they are somehow inherently neutral. Sure. Like sure. Um, a firearm or a shovel, or a knife, right. or a chainsaw are all tools. Right. And the problem comes with whether you use some to commit acts of violence or whether you use them to chop down trees and target practice and hunting. Sure. Um, so we can come back to the tools point, yeah. I, I think. But you're, the procrastination and the short-termism mm -hmm. raises some really significant questions, to my mind, for mm -hmm. um, Christian life. Yeah. Because if you think about the Christian life, what, what are the things that are really profoundly significant? to the long-term formation of individual human lives mm. and family life and church life. They're things like getting married mm -hmm. and raising children and a family and education, whether your own education mm -hmm. or your children's education. Then their vocation, whether the, the vocation might be raising children or it might be like you're a teacher or I'm a pastor or somebody else is an insurance salesman or a real estate agent or that the, these things and and all of those callings all, all of those activities whether our callings and um, the task of raising our kids mm -hmm. um, developing healthy relationships um, not to mention just basic Christian disciplines of what goes into becoming a man or a woman who is wise in the scriptures and who knows the Lord. 
Um, These are things that cannot be accomplished quickly. Correct. They yep. are the they're right at one end of a spectrum of delayed gratification. Mm-hmm. Like anybody who failed the marshmallow test or the Oreo test is never going to have such a good chance <laughs> of accomplishing these things well as somebody who passed it. Right. And so my concern is that you have this twofold negative impact of a lot of these technologies on mothers and fathers and mm-hmm. husbands and wives and workers and school children yeah. and all of us in our different vocations, both that it distracts us from actually doing those things. Mum mm-hmm. is on Facebook again, and I wanted some help with my poetry homework. Right. Or that it actually trains our minds simply not to be able to do these things. Mm-hmm. It trains us, and it goes back to your original point, it's as though you were, you were noticing something about your own cognitive capacity that was diminishing in your, what, late 20s, early 30s, right. way too early. Right. Um, and maybe this is, you know, I, I, want, I want my concentration back. I want my focus back, yeah. which means I need to stamp on whatever is depriving me of that focus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, priorities. Um, right. You know, right. I'm, there are going to be things, if I, if I don't have calendar notifications beeping at me, I, I don't have to-do list reminders beeping at me, um, reminding me, there are going to be things that fall through the cracks. Right. Um, and, you know, so I forget to do something that I should have done. Um, what that should do, as it has done for millennia is train me to do better in the sense of organizing my own priorities, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and teaching me instead of having a complete and utter reliance upon this thing. So that if I lose this thing, you know, the tool, um, that I am, I'm lost without it. Right. So you say you're trying to do without a to-do list or a task it's not that I do without a to-do list. I, I, I do, but I, 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 I do write them down physically right, right, on right. paper. I carry them with me. Um, I, I, have a, I try my best to keep my calendar on a, only on a paper calendar. Right. Um, some of those things are, okay, I, I literally have a limited amount of space to fit into that box, <laughs> right? you know, and just to, I mean, things like that. And this even gets into our loan limitations of, mm-hmm. of, I have a limited amount of time and I have a physical representation of my own limitations Yes, um, yes. on that box. Because you've only got an inch and a quarter of space. Right, exactly. To write. But at the same time, that is not, in, you know, I don't carry around my planner around in my pocket all the time. Right. And so I have to make a cognizant uh, choice to remember mm-hmm. the things that are important for the day, um, and order my, my order, my thinking, yes, you know, yes. accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's interesting just picking up the threads of a number of things you've mentioned mm-hmm. about taking the easy path, about planning your, trying to make decisions in such a way that you choose the best things, not the worst things. Mm-hmm. It keys directly into the biblical doctrine of sin, mm-hmm. which one of the one of the features of of human of Christian psychology is that in our best moments, all of us would be able to resist nearly every or every temptation we've ever succumbed to. Mm-hmm. If if you got a man at his finest, most strong, clear headed, focused, committed moment, he would never do any of the sins at that moment. Right that he's done for the previous week or the previous year or the previous 10 years. Mm-hmm. So why is it that we fall prey? No, that's the wrong way of putting it. Why is it that we plunge into yeah. such foolish temptations? The answer is we're not always right-minded. We're not mm-hmm. always thinking straight. We're not always evaluating our priorities appropriately. We don't, we don't always prize Jesus and right. faithfulness to him as we should. Yeah. So how do you protect yourself from that? Well, the way you do it is by making decisions when you're clear-headed that restrict the abuse of your freedom mm-hmm. when you're not. So the classic one of this would be for like a, a, anybody who's got some kind of internet filter, mm-hmm. which is now we're on the actual content of this of the, that the platform presents you with. Right. Um, if, if you've not got something to stop you 
viewing pornography mm -hmm. or at least to notify your wife or your husband or your pastor or your best friend or your mother-in-law if you do view it, mm -hmm. then you are betting on your ability always to be able to resist the temptation to, to do something destructive, right. even when you're weakest, mm -hmm. which is a really stupid bet. Like, I, I bet anybody could resist such temptations, you know, at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning as they're walking out the door to get to church. Like, right. I bet you could. Right. I, I somehow doubt that, you, that we've all got the same reserves of willpower and godliness 10, mm -hmm. 10 or 12 hours previously. Right. So what do you do? Well, you make a decision on Sunday morning that restricts your freedom right. the next Saturday night. Right. And the interesting point about that is that's actually not restricting your freedom in the proper sense. Mm -hmm. Because what if we think about freedom theologically, mm -hmm. freedom, it's freedom from what? Sometimes we think about freedom as though it's only the lack of constraint from external forces. Right. Um, and that's often how um, people like myself, as a libertarian-minded Christian, mm -hmm. will think of it. Yeah. Freedom means that the state isn't interfering with you, basically. Right. Well, that's not the only way of the, the only important way of viewing freedom. If I give somebody a bowl of live cockroaches and they choose to eat them, they're not free because there's something con there's something internal to them that is constraining them to do something really dis destructive and ruinous. Yeah. So actually, what, what, what would make a man free is to be liberated to make good choices. Right. Um, in other words, and this is Ken Meyer's way of putting it, you can't have a notion of freedom which is abstracted from a notion of the good. Right. You have to have a, a framework for moral evaluation. Mm -hmm. And then what counts as freedom is the capacity to choose that which is good. Right. Not even God has liberty of indifference. God can't sin. Mm -hmm. But God is perfectly free because God always chooses that which is good. Right. So in one sense, this is a, again, this is just this theological thread kind of pulling on it and, yeah. and seeing where it leads. Mm -hmm. it, this is, uh, one way of saying this is it's, it's, it's a way of seeking to grow in Christ-likeness. Yeah. Because we're, we're recognizing the power of this technology and its very power is its strength and its weakness. Mm -hmm. So how do you harness it? Well, you use, you, you make decisions that restrict your actions. Right. So that you become more liberated. Yes. Yeah. And I, again, it, it, when you fall into a situation where other people are pulling the strings, have more influence over your mm. decisions than you do yourself. Right, right, right. You're setting yourself up for failure, yeah, yeah. especially when you're talking about for-profit companies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they, it, it, this, this actually takes us in the direction that I wanted to talk about, the, the whole non-neutrality of tools point. Uh, right. Um, I recently gave a talk. Um, which I, I'll try and, if I remember, I'll link it in um, uh, the show notes um hold on i'm making note of that um that where i i quoted the the introductory page to neil postman's book amusing ourselves to death right. which i i'm coming to regard as one of the most important pieces of prose ever written about the state of our modern world and he contrasts the he wrote it in 1985 which is really scary oh wow <laughs> right um uh, and he was writing, of course, in the wake of 1984, which is George Orwell's novel, written in 1948. Mm -hmm. And he talks about two dystopian visions of the future. Mm -hmm. um, one in which it was impossible to read a book because it had all been taken away. 1984, right. this mm -hmm. is George Orwell's vision of external oppression. Right. He said there's another slightly older, less well-known dystopian vision, uh, Brave New World Brave, Brave New by World. Huxley, right. in which it wasn't the case that there were no books. It's just they, nobody would ever read a book because nobody wanted to. Right. And what's happened, what Huxley depicts is a world in which there are these devices to stimulate happy feelings. Um, the, um, what is it, the feelies, the orgy-porgy, and the centrifugal bumble puppy. I think they're the, the devices, and you can read the book. It's an amazing book. It's, uh, probably lots of high school students have read it. Yeah. But it just struck me like a, a brick between the eyes that what's happened with this social media stuff is they're just so much smarter than that. It's not that you get hooked up to a machine that makes you feel good. You buy the machine. Right. <laughs> you, you, you voluntarily 
do stuff with the screen that injects the chemicals into the receptors in your brain that make you feel happy. Mm -hmm. And what happens is the companies who you bought the machine off and other tech companies make money from advertising revenue. I mean, you are are literally becoming like one of the batteries in the Matrix. Uh It's just really (laughs) unnerving. Now, Huxley didn't have... You know, he wasn't the futurist who would be able to predict how his devices would come to pass. But right. the structure is exactly there. Mm-hmm. Now, that reading that, that um, and I'll try and, like I said, remember to link the talk back about it, but just get the book, uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death. Um, one of the features of Postman's work is he's writing in a, in a tradition of a number of writers, mm-hmm. uh, Marshall McLuhan, Neil Postman, Ken Myers more recently, mm-hmm. who who point out in um, McLuhan's words, the medium is the message. Yeah. Well, yeah, you wrote a book called The Medium is the Massage, which is like a play on words, yeah. um, a pun, to, to make the point even more forcefully. But the, the point is the technology is not neutral. Like, it's not a tool. It's not a tool. Yeah. Because every medium inevitably influences what can be done in and through it. The transition from oral to written to print to mass print Mm -hmm. to video to to TV Mm -hmm. or radio first, then TV, and now to internet, then to internet audio, and now internet video, and now wherever we are with these kind of shorts and all those kinds of things, little videos. Mm -hmm. They the 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 form that the communication takes place in Mm -hmm. saturates what can be done. Right. And in, in one sense, it strikes me that you, your decision, and in fact, the decisions that, to a lesser extent, I've made and other people have made, or I want to encourage everybody to make, right. what we're trying to say is, please try and consider how the medium is contaminating the message. Yeah. How the, the, the content is shaped by the lens through which you view it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think about this um, when you see a concert mm-hmm. or, a, or a football match or something, then you've got you know thousands of people with their phones up in the air. Right. And they're taking this multi-dimensional experience <laughs> and they're cramming it into two dimensions. Yes. You know. Five-inch screen. Right. Yeah, exactly. And whether or not they're, you know, just holding it in the air and they've got their eyes on what's actually going on or not, or trying to save that experience, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're valuing and or rather devaluing mm-hmm. all of the other elements of that experience and cramming it into mm-hmm. a two dimensional experience. So um, an example, like, like I said, this, this, phone um, has been a pain in the rear in some ways. So for example, and there are no autocorrect. And, <laughs> and initially, uh, and it, this has gotten better, but initially there was no voice transcription and there was no moving the cursor either. And so, and it's like if, if you've tried to type on, to a, delete. on a Kindle Paperwhite, I mean, and it's super slow. Um, and so I'd get to the end of a sentence, realize that I'm word was misspelled at the beginning of the sentence. And I just, I, it, it really pains me to send that message with a misspelled word. And so I would just say, forget it. I'm not, I would just close it out completely. And if it was important enough, I would make the phone call. Mm. And so, and I realized that's, that's wonderful. Like that's exactly mm. what I should, you know, right. that's what you of, bought it for. That's exactly. Instead of cramming this relational exchange, whatever it is into bits of it, not mm. bytes, bits of information yes. um, that at the very least, at least with a voice, you've got tone and intonation and mm. recognition and emotion that's being communicated. And so you're expanding those things to what the experience was always meant to be. Right. right. And we've all had this experience, haven't we? When you send an email and you're asking a question and somebody emails back, yes. And you think, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> or at least, at least there's a certain set of character uh, traits that you know so that lean us in that direction to feel uh-huh. slightly oh my goodness did i is he a bit annoyed with me for in, that seems like a very curt and short answer right, right? <laughs> whereas if you ask me a question across the room or you called me and said hey can i do this I'd be like, yeah sure and 
And you wouldn't think... <laughs> so right. so that, that's a prosaic sense in which the medium shapes the message. But yes. there, are, there are deeper senses. I mean, I, I think probably it's not... It's beyond me to... Um, to weave that tapestry. Mm. It, Postman does it brilliantly in his book mm. Technopoly as well. Mm. What it does highlight for me, though, is I think this is a helpful point because it prevents us from focusing on smartphones as though they're like the beast or something. Sure. This is a version of the same problem that humanity has always had mm. with the emergence of any new technology. So every new technology that's ever been devised has shaped human life in unanticipated negative ways, mm. as well as in anticipated positive ways. Mm -hmm. So I actually tried to flesh this out again a few months ago um, at the church in Nacogdoches. I was talking to some guys there, and I, I, I have it in the back of my mind to talk about it with the men here at, at All Saints. Maybe we'll talk about it at some point in the future. Yeah. But take one example. Um, the, the step from making cars by three or four guys building the entire car mm -hmm. to Henry Ford's production line, which mm -hmm. happened quite early in the development of cars. Sure. And it meant that suddenly, within 20 years of the invention or 40 years of the invention of these things, a car assembly line worker could buy what he was making with three or four months' salary, mm -hmm. which is about what a car costs new now. Mm -hmm. You can buy a decent car with four months' salary, probably, yeah. which is an amazing innovation. It totally transforms the economic landscape and allows people to participate in the economic fruits of what they're doing. Right. But <laughs> you see the problem, yeah. right? So previously, your job was you're a craftsman mm -hmm. who made these beautiful um, machines. Mm -hmm. And now your job consists of nine hours a day of repeating a task that takes 17 seconds. Right. You your entire vocation mm -hmm. has shrunk. And it's not that it's not valuable. Of course it's valuable. It's tremendously valuable. Right. But it, it, there's a trade-off. There's no free lunch. The, the economics, which is to say the science of human action, is all about right. trade-off. So what's the downside here? And I bet nobody spotted the downside when they were making the pitch to build the factory. <laughs> right. But you see this throughout history with the invention of, industrialization and steam engines and, and all the factory workers um, putting the hand loom weavers out of business and you see it with the invention of the wheel and you see it with the invention of the stirrup which suddenly right. means that you can fight on horseback and right. every technological development has brought these problems right and like this is just the latest right well you know and i um i think through a, a at the uh, ACCS conference this summer, uh, Carl Truman gave a talk on on technology and authority. Right. Um, it was just really fascinating and, and wonderful, but talking about how progressive technologies, as you mentioned, um, allowed mankind to kind of overcome some of the mm -hmm. natural earth-bounded authority right, that we right, had, right? right? And so, you know, used to, we'd have to honor the authority of the seasons. And so now, yes. when I go to the supermarket, I can buy any fruit or vegetable that I want, no matter yeah. the time of year. Yes. Um, both because of supply chains internationally, but also different, you know, varying agricultural practices that allow for those things <laughs> to take place, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, that to your point that that reshapes our orientation towards the world mm. um so you're right it does it does allow us to accomplish some things that we weren't able to but it, but it fundamentally uh, changes the way that we see the world you know right, he, right, he made right. the point that me being able to be in Europe in 12 hours yes yes isn't just a matter of speed yeah right it's it also fundamentally changes the way that I see the way the world works yes. and my orientation within it. Yes. Yeah, no, it's such a profound point because you, on, you, you could parse that as what a glorious step forward in our accomplishment of the cultural mandate. Right. We're taking dominion over time. Right. So that now I can have an orange every day of the year. Uh -huh. Whereas previously... If I lived in Britain, I'd get no oranges at all. Mm -hmm. And if I lived in Florida, I'd get them for two months of the year. Mm -hmm. And Texas, maybe four weeks of the year because they get brought out here, but, but they right. rot on the way if you're not. Right. So you're taking dominion over 
space and time. Right. But every act of dominion, when undertaken by sinful creatures, has idolatrous potential. Yeah. And so I, I wonder if in this case, I mean, it's almost linked to the embodiment thing, isn't it? We are physical creatures. Mm-hmm. What this allows us to do is to transcend our physical limitations. Yeah. Is that a good thing? I've, that's a fascinating ethical question. Oh yeah, is it a good thing to transcend our physical limitations? Well, yeah, it is great if you're um, if you live in Texas and your parents live in England mm-hmm. and you want to talk to them. Right. I, I really like that blessing right. of being able to transcend my physical limitations. <laughs> Absolutely. If I'm in a car accident and I, I need to call nine one one or my wife, mm-hmm. I really like that. Yeah. But Transcending physical limitations when you've been created with a physical body. Right. What's the trade-off? You know, it, right. There's a right. There's going to be one. Um, I look. Yeah, I often say that you know these smartphones allow us to kind of take for our own some godlike qualities. Of, Correct. Yes. Right. Which um, is exactly what Genesis one twenty six twenty eight is. Right. About. It's becoming like God. Right. Yeah. Some omnipotence of being able yes. to say, "I want this thing ordered on Amazon, and I've got it tomorrow morning if I you know pay the pay the price." Um, or omniscience of being able to know everything. Mm. At all times. And if yeah. I don't know it in my brain, I can, you know, what's the name of that one guy in that one movie? I can look it up and there it is. Mm. Um, and so, you know, you're right. Good and bad in the sense of, okay, um, the bad, obviously, like I don't need, go back to Facebook, I don't need to know every detail of every person's life that I've ever met. Mm. You know, that's yeah. that's not a level of knowledge that we need to have. Right, right. And craving that does seem idolatrous at some level. Right, right, right. Um, however, understanding how our churches are behaving, like the decisions that we make here and how mm-hmm. those decisions impact other places in the world. Yes. Now that's a level of knowledge that I could see being useful. Yes. yes. You know, um, being able to send aid to churches in Ukraine, yes, you know, yes. those kinds of things. Yes. And I think the challenge is there to be, brutally honest with ourselves Mm -hmm. about what the trade-offs actually are because Mm -hmm. that whenever you have a a situation in which there are trade-offs to be made in in working out what's the wise cause Mm -hmm. the the grave temptation is to overlook or try to sideline or ignore the downsides by just talking about the upsides so somebody who's listened to this you know we're 45 minutes in and and if they've got this far and they're, they're a bit frustrated because I think we're a bit down on technology, I'm not down on technology, right? But the, the temptation is for somebody to push back simply by pointing out, but look at all the good things it enables you to do. And I'm not wanting to say to them those things don't exist. Mm-hmm. What I'm wanting to say is that's one half of the argument. Please, will you honestly, honestly articulate the other side of the argument? What's it actually costing you? And if the history of technology is anything to go by, it is costing you far more than you might realize. Mm -hmm. That's the crucial lesson of the the kind of curve of technological development over time. Technological advances always, always bring with them unanticipated negative side effects that threaten to shatter some people's experience of them. Right. And this is so pervasive that it's likely to have that. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm also convinced, you know, again, I I mentioned the just incredible spike in depression and anxiety rates Mm. and and whatnot. And I'm just absolutely convinced that this materialistic worldview is being kind of, that's, this is one of the main avenues in which is being pumped into our area. And, um, and so it, you know, focusing on what's, you know, the purpose of life and making everything about us and about our individual stories and those kinds of, yes. like it's, it's focusing our, our worldview, um, literally in, in ways in which are taking our eyes off of, off, off of the ball. Yes. Um, as yes. it were biblically. Yeah. Um, and so I, I just, I, I, I can't quite articulate it as well as I would as I would like to, but I'm absolutely convinced. And obviously, with teenagers, it's just been incredibly destructive. Yeah, um, yeah and yeah, so yeah. that's that would be a big a big warning sign for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. as well. I, 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 I want to finish because I'm conscious you need to go. We've got both got stuff we need to do. Yeah, um, I want to just raise one more subject, which might seem 
highly tangential, but actually is profoundly related to this topic, I think. Um, and it's a topic of woodwork, woodcraft. Okay. You are a uh, highly skilled carpenter and woodworker. I'm a it's debatable, fairly but... <laughs> <laughs> low-skilled woodworker who's very enthusiastic about the lathe that he received as a gift a few months ago from a friend. Um, let me tell you my experience with this, and then you tell me whether it resonates with yours, and then I just want to let you finish and conclude with any final comments you want to make. Okay. So I discovered quite quickly when you're turning wood on a lathe that you mm. cannot do anything else at the same time. Okay. Um, you certainly can't be concentrating on anything else at the sure. same time. Yeah. Initially, I was wood turning, and I'd have a podcast running on headphones or something. But then I found myself either not listening to the podcast or listening to it and getting distracted from what I was doing. And mm -hmm. if you'd get distracted on a lathe, you could lose a finger or an eye or yes. something quite quickly. So, <laughs> yes, yes. Or you could at least break the thing you're working on. Uh -huh. And so I made a decision that I would not try to multitask yeah. in that domain. Yeah. And I would... This would be, you know, if I spend like a couple of hours on a Saturday morning or something, you know, trying to turn a bowl. It would be a, a time in which one of the things I'm doing is simply engaging with something that is far more physical and located and mm -hmm. tangible yeah. than the non-physical, um, spatially transcendent um, medium of everything internet. Right. And it's actually right. profoundly restful. Yes. Um, not to mention, I mean, just... I mean, Wood itself is one example of something which is tremendously beautiful. Yeah, I, I always love the thought. You know, when you when you when you turn a piece of wood and, and you start to get down to the end of it and and, and you're making it the finished beautiful. You're seeing something beautiful that God made mm. for the very first time. Nobody has ever seen the inside of that log before. Yeah, that's beautiful. and you're seeing the grain of that wood and it's just. I've got a little piece there which is like it was one of my early experiments and mm. and nobody else can see that because it's on audio and it's just like it's a it's a beautiful thing. It's, I'm not skilled. You don't have to be skilled to make things beautiful because the world is beautiful. Right. So for me, it's just a really helpful contrast. Yes. And a, it's like a counterweight. Yeah. It, it, I think it's probably helping me in the longer term to push back against the, the weight of everything delocalized, everything yeah. internet, everything virtual, right. by having something that I love doing yeah. that is concrete and physical. I'm not saying everybody should go out and buy a lathe, but I would encourage people to get a hobby. Get If you haven't got one already, get something that you enjoy doing, which is absorbing, mentally mm -hmm. taxing to a certain extent, and physical. Yeah. And I'd love to just hear your final reflections just on you know, how, what you enjoy in woodworking, and then yeah. any other final thoughts just to wrap up. Um, well, I, I was dwelling on you know, what... What exactly is it about some of these technologies that make it idolatrous? Like, what's the, you know, going back to that line of where, how do we make it, what, what's the difference between useful and, and idolatrous? And to me, one of those pieces is creating ex nihilo. Right. Um, and so this is like, you, you know, you go the extreme of the metaverse and whatever <laughs> yes. and creating a universe in our image, right? Yes. We get to decide um, everything about That's it. exactly yeah. right. Um, versus um, what you get in the cultural mandate of taking God's good creation mm. and cultivating it. It's constraint because of God's right. Work, yeah. So we're creating, but we're not creating out of nothing. Um, mm. You know, we are taking what God has given us and molding it, yes. and using it, making it useful, making it beautiful in its own way. You know, in different ways, and and so. That's something I think that we lose or that I gain, I know, uh, just speaking for myself, that when I, when I work with wood, that I, am, I have something tangible. I have something that's starting out as a raw material and I'm making it into something else. And I can, I can look, you know, so go to the productivity conversation of I can see a physical thing that, mm. that I made. I can look at that. I can feel that satisfaction. Yes. Um, and and it's, an, it's a gesture of submission because you cannot turn right. an 8-inch log into a 12-inch table. You know, yes, like, you're right. <laughs> it, or a 12-inch bowl. It's like you're, yes. you are bounded by God's... That's exactly right. Right. And I would love... I mean, um, 
I had dreams of making it my, a, a profession at some point. And so mm-hmm. you kind of, you, you almost have to, unless you're a very skilled in a certain sense, uh, have to go to power tools. But I would love, you know, if it's just a hobby to really just stay in kind of the hand mm-hmm. tools. I think there's something fundamentally just healthy about slowing down yes, yes. and slowly crafting something. Um, when you think about like, you know, Luke 24 and Jesus walking with the disciples on the road mm-hmm. to Emmaus and, and, and those, the, the immense amount of time that these guys had yeah, 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 to yeah. just dwell on yes. things, to think about things that had happened, to think about words, to let them bounce around in their mm-hmm. heads. And we just don't give ourselves time. Yes. Yes. Um, and so slowing down, that's, you know, again, com- combining that with the woodworking, slowing down, letting those things just mellow in yes. my mind as I'm crafting. And that's just, a, it's a beautiful experience. You can't rush it. Right. Yeah. The glue has to dry. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. Any final thoughts to leave us with? I would just say, you know, obviously we, we haven't come up with any silver bullets. Um, okay. This, even this, you know, going back to where we started, the phone's not a, it's not a final solution for me. You know, I, I, I'm trying to retrain my brain because I'm recognizing that my brain has been trained by right, others. Right, right. right. And so I'm, I'm trying to take back possession of what God has given me in that sense um, and using it uh, for his glory, um, not for others and making money off of my time. Um, and so, you know, it's just about being cognizant of those things and, and understanding the ways in which these things are being used for others gain mm. um, and not for the gain of Christ. Mm. So that's helpful. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate your time. And um, the Lord bless you. Listeners, um, if they wanted to talk to you more about this, they can come find you at church, right? Absolutely. And if you don't come to All Saints, well, there are uh, some other resources that uh, we've talked about in this uh, discussion, and I will endeavor to ensure that links to them get posted somewhere if you can't find them, then get in touch with somebody here at All Saints and we'll try and help you out with that. Thank you. (laughs) 